All right, welcome back and thanks for tuning in again. So we got something a little bit different today. This is a Cummins Power Generation home standby generator. Runs on natural gas or propane. It's a 20 kilowatt model GSBB. This has a problem and it's a problem of the worst kind. It's an intermittent problem. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It was actually replaced under warranty for this issue. So we're gonna take a look at this thing, identify what it's doing, and see if we can determine what it's gonna take to get it right. All right, well I flipped the lid open on this thing so we can take a look inside. Now I mentioned that this unit was replaced under warranty. I didn't say what year it is. It's actually a 2015 model GSBB. The customer had purchased the extended five-year warranty for it, and it failed, well, about, about four or five months ago, so they were still within their warranty period. The reason it was replaced is because the component that is faulty is no longer available from Cummins. And uh, that component is the main rotor, or the rotor of the generator. Down in there. We'll get to that in a little bit. So before we start diving into it, I want to show you exactly what this thing is doing. I apologize for any wind noise. So let's just flip it to manual here. There you go. Speed sense loss, fault number 45. Okay, so let me try to break down what you just witnessed. So I gave the unit a start command by hitch, pushing that little toggle switch there to manual run. At that point, the controller initiated a crank cycle. Now, a crank cycle is a, a predetermined length of time that the control panel will crank the engine over before it says, hey, the thing didn't start. So when I initiated the crank cycle, we heard the engine, the starter engage, the engine generator assembly begin to crank over. Now at that time, after yeah, a, couple, a second or so of cranking, the engine fired, the governor began to ramp the engine speed up, but the control panel did not detect any engine speed. At that time, it cut back on the throttle the engine died down. Remember, the starter motor is still engaged. After a second of that, the control panel tried to bring the governor back up or speed the engine back up, which the engine did. It ramped back up again with the starter motor still engaged. You heard that horrible whining, but the units, the control panel still did not see any speed signal, at which point the control panel aborted the start process and we got that fault code 45. So one thing you got to realize first with these units is they use the generator's output frequency to measure speed. There's no crank sensor, there's no magnetic pickup on the flywheel, they use the actual output from the generator. Well, in this case, the generator had no output. It was making, generating no AC voltage on the, uh, the, the stator windings for the control panel to detect. And there's a very simple reason for that, and that's because I disconnected one of the two field, field wires. This happens to be, let's see, F1. I disconnected F1. Therefore, we had no DC input to the main rotor and no AC output from the stator for the control panel to detect speed from. The reason I disconnected this was to replicate the problem for you and show you what this unit was doing in the field. Now I'm going to reconnect F1, if I can here, give me a sec, okay, and let's try a start again here. And we got to start with no issues. So here's where the intermittent part comes into this problem. 
Okay, well as you can see, the generator operates now. Let's move the thing inside and go over the troubleshooting steps that were done in the field to determine that we have a rotor issue and maybe, well, well actually we have to, we gotta dig in and see if we can determine what the actual issue is on the rotor and if it can be repaired since another one is not available. All right, let's go inside. Okay, so we got the unit moved inside out of the cold and the wind and the first thing I wanna do is outline the troubleshooting steps that I took in the field to determine that we had an issue with the generator's rotor. So the unit had the fault that we saw uh, earlier in the video, that fault 45 for speed sensing loss. So being that I know that the generator is using, or the control panel is using generator output frequency for speed sensing, that tells, told me, well, first place to look is the generator. So first point to check is to see if we've got any AC output from the field windings. Now, I checked AC output here on the line side terminals of the output breaker. Got one here and one around the corner there. It's kind of hard to access, but this module, this box is the circuit breaker. It's got a little plastic cover covering up the handle there. But that's the output breaker. So checking for AC power on the line side of that breaker. Clip my meter leads on there and try to start the unit. So the unit cranked and it behaved as we saw earlier. I did not get any appreciable AC power, AC voltage on the line side of that breaker. And there's nothing between the line side of that breaker and the stator windings. Just the leads come right off there and go right into the stator. So I would expect to see in the neighborhood of say 20 to 50 volts at cranking speed. Enough voltage to, which that is enough voltage to generate a signal strong enough to the control panel to say, hey, okay, the engine's cranking, let me monitor this and that way it knows when to pull the starter motor out and the, when the engine's got up to speed. So we had no AC output. Well, if we have no AC output, the easiest thing to do from there is look for DC input to the generator. So we've got to determine if we had DC input to the field, which is the rotor. So took my meter, put one lead on this terminal, left these two leads connected to the brush block. This is the brush block, by the way. So put a lead here and a lead on the back here. Kind of hard to see, but it's back there not on the screw head, but this, these two, well, this bolt and there's one around the back here that just hold the brush block down. So looking for DC power, feeding the brush block. I did, I had it. So at cranking speed, I had about 12 or 13 volts, which was, you know, thereabouts battery voltage. So I believe that these control panels just feed battery voltage directly to the field during cranking to get a little, uh, voltage established so that they can detect the engine speed. But whatever, wherever that comes from, it's kind of irrelevant. We had it feeding the brushes, we, but we didn't have any AC output. Okay, so the next thing we gotta check is make sure that we're getting a circuit, or we have a good circuit from the terminals here to the actual main rotor winding. So for that, I just pulled off these leads here Pull off this one and this one, just don't get them confused. Stick that one over there. Set my meter on uh, resistance and we measured between this terminal here and that terminal there. And we had complete open circuit. No continuity whatsoever between this point and this point. Okay, well that could very easily be the brushes. So maybe this one of these uh, little wires here, these two pigtails, little copper pigtails come off of these uh, quick disconnect terminals and go right down to the brushes. Maybe we got a bad connection there. Maybe the brushes aren't making contact. So easy enough to rule that out is to come down here to the slip rings themselves or the collector rings as some would like to call them. So just uh, took and piece of Scotch-Brite and buffed 
the slip rings up, put my meter leads directly on the rings themselves, the brass rings, looking again for resistance through the main rotor. I had a complete open circuit. I had no continuity from this ring to this ring. Now I'll say that I also had no continuity to ground, which, which was a good thing, but I had a complete open circuit in the rotor. And with a complete open circuit in the rotor, there's no way for this thing to generate anything more than residual magnetism, which isn't very much on a unit like this with, you know, so little iron mass to it. So rotor's open circuit. Now it could, it could be disassembled and inspected, possibly rewound, but for the cost of this unit, remember it was under warranty, Cummins would have had to foot the bill for that. So it was just easier for them to say, hey, the thing's under warranty. The rotor itself is no longer available from us. We'll give you a new generator. So that's how we got to where we are now. <laughs> now, I was going to make this video last week, and then I realized, hey, let me, let me set the thing up outside and, you know, go through. And I was actually kind of pre-staging the video to kind of get everything in line for what I wanted to say. And I figured, okay, well, let me uh, just, you know, give it a start and uh, make sure that my gas hookup was correct and the engine tried to fire. Well, sure enough, it fired up and ran, much to my surprise, because the last time I was in this thing, the rotor was open circuit. Well, it's not now, as we can see. So we've got some kind of intermittent open circuit in that rotor, which means we've got to tear the thing down and have a real close inspection of it to see if we can find out where the issue is. Okay, so I've made some progress tearing into this thing. So the biggest problem or the biggest annoyance was that uh, I had to remove the uh, muffler or the exhaust pipes off the engine here. Uh, in order to be able to swing the muffler, it has a support bracket. Swing this little bracket out and around the mounting foot for the stator. So I'm going to set you up on the tripod here and see if I can slide the stator off. Got a few more bolts to take out, but I figure I'll leave the camera rolling for that. I'm going to take the brush block off. That way we don't damage the, uh, the brushes or anything. Just little number eight, uh, eight millimeter bolts in here. Now the, uh, <clears throat> the rear bearing frame here can either stay on the, the stator itself or we can take it off. It really doesn't matter. So we'll see. If it wants to come off, it'll come off. If not, we'll worry about that later. But what I want to be able to, what I want to do is move these four nuts. I got a piece of brass and a hammer here and we'll see if we can knock the stator off off of the housing. But before we do that, we've got to lift the back end up and back end up and I've got a little piece of wood there we got to shim under the engine with cuz I've already removed the the through bolts for the uh rear uh motor mounts or the rear mounts the rubber mounts this one bolt's fighting me back here come on there we go okay Brushes look okay. All right. I'm just going to lift the lift the stator up and slip this piece of wood under here if I can. There we go. slide the whole thing out a little bit. There we go. Shifted that muffler bracket.
see these uh, rods are ready to come on out. Actually, I think I'll leave the top two in. Can I remove these bottom ones? No, they're tight. This one's loose. Might as well leave them all in. Okay. So, got to take my hammer and my little piece of brass here. And there's a little step where the rear bearing housing casting overhangs the stator just a little bit, just enough to get this little piece of brass hooked onto. Pound a little bit on this side. All right, now that we got a gap opened up, we should be able to just work this off with a couple of flathead screwdrivers. Okay. That was easy enough. Now, we should be able to slip the stator right off of the rotor. This. Now, I just want to be careful not to drag it too hard, drag the stator too hard on the rotor. On a small unit like this, there's not much damage you could do, but just when you're sliding it back, you don't want it to drop as soon as you get the stator laminations off of the rotor laminations. You don't want it to drop and fall and bang into the slip rings or the bearing or anything like that. That's kind of why these will help guide me out, these studs. So I gotta slide the whole thing over a little bit more. There we go. We got a problem. Damn. Okay, sorry I jumped ahead of you there. A little embarrassing seeing myself fight with this thing. So really the issue was that I, I should have looked to see if that mounting foot was gonna clear this part of the enclosure, and it didn't. It was, you know, maybe about a half an inch. It didn't wanna clear, so I had to, had to work at it a little bit, but it's okay, it's out now. So the stator itself, now, one thing you notice right off the bat, and one thing I noticed right off the bat that I haven't mentioned yet, is you'll notice that half of the windings are dark, dark colored for some reason. Now, uh, this is not the first time I've seen this on a Cummins gen set, on one of these new small Cummins generators. For some reason, some of the wiring, they used a dark colored varnish on and some they used the regular kind of clear varnish. It's very deceiving and you know first time I saw that I had to ask myself whoa wait what's going on here so but nope that's just the way they are so if you see that immediately don't uh, rush to conclusions. One thing that I did notice is something has been where's my little flashlight at here we go something Turn this camera light off. Oop, hang on. And turn that off and bring, come in with this. Or maybe not, maybe, that, maybe that's worse. So, you can see right here and right here, and even some evidence right here, something has either been nibbling at that varnish or something got wrapped around the rotor while it was running and scratched the varnish here. See if I can zoom in on that. Nice and slow. See that? Right there, especially. And it's not only that spot. 
There's a couple other points right there. There's one. Oop, too fast. And there's another one. There's multiple points around the edge of the stator where something has been dragging along those windings right there again. So it, that's going to have to get addressed. But we're not going to worry about that right now because we know it does make voltage. All right, so let's take a look at the rotor here. I've already kind of spun it over looking for anything obvious. And, you know, these uh, a rotor on a generator, uh, I should say a, ro a generator that has a rotating field is extremely simple. You got one side's the north pole, one side's the south pole, and you've got a magnetic field that's produced between here and here. So this is just one large coil. It goes in from one of the slip rings. There's a little stud right there. One of the rings it pretty much just intercepts the wire. That wire goes in, wraps on this side, and you can see the crossover right here. It comes out of that one, goes into this one, wraps along there, and there's a similar stud right there where it comes out to the other slip ring. So it's just a circuit. Goes in one, through it, and then out the other. So, let me put you on the stand here. Give me a sec. I was taking a look at the, at the uh, rotor here, and I figured, well, you know what? Let's check the obvious. I did a visual inspection of the windings. They look fine. I don't see anything out of place there. Let me make sure you're still in, in the uh, shot here. Yep. So we got my meter set up, and I figured, well, I, I, you know, the most apparent or logical place where there could be a, an issue is where this winding wire, where this junction is made from the wire to the little stud that goes to the slip ring. So let's see, we'll put my probes together. We got 0.2. I got a nice buffed shiny spot on the slip rings. So right now, rotor resistance you know what, let me do this so you might be able to see the meter. Rotor resistance is 27.4. Okay, so I'm going to hold the probes on with one hand and with a screwdriver. I'm just going to touch this wire right here and see if I can jostle it around a little bit. Look at that. <laughs> Just the slightest bit of pressure and I can open that circuit. So there's the intermittent problem. Right there. I'm going to just touch it with my finger. <laughs> That's funny. So <laughs> it's just a bad connection right there. What if I put some pressure on the plastic? No, I can't disturb it there but just a slight, slight touch with the screwdriver right there and I can do it gently and there, there's it increasing and then goes right open circuit. That's crazy. Completely open circuit. So that was the intermittent fault. I was going to say this really had me racking my brain because you know, I almost felt like I had misdiagnosed the problem when I was uh, p preparing to do this video. You know, I took the generator out, hooked it up to the gas, and hit the start switch, and it started. And I said, oh, this is not good. Well, I was right. That's good. So we didn't, uh, we didn't misdiagnose the problem. We definitely have an issue here. Yep. Yep. Okay, well, I'm going to have to identify 
how this is assembled. I don't believe this is meant to be serviceable. But I'm probably going to have to pull the bearing off the shaft and pull the slip rings off the shaft. I want to avoid taking this rotor off if I can. That's a real pain in the butt trying to break that taper. So if I can, I'd like to do it on the engine itself. So yeah, let me get the let me get this nut off, get this stud pulled off the center. We'll we'll pull the bearing off and we'll see about pulling these slip rings off and go from there. I need to pull the slip ring assembly off the shaft. I've sanded and scotch breaded the shaft here to kind of get the rust off. Hopefully this whole assemb this whole block will slide off of here without too much trouble. So we know the other wire is already kind of dangling in the air. I'm going to go ahead and snip the other end of the coil right here. Snip that at the stud because I don't want to, just in case this thing wants to pull that wire along with it, I don't want it to break farther back because I, this one here I could probably take a winding off if I needed to, but the other one goes to the bottom of this coil, if you know what I mean. So the little piece that's hanging out is all I have. And I'm also going to put a little, a little mark here on the, on the block itself, just so I know approximately where it has to line up on the shaft. Really, it's so that I know that, say, that this stud connects to this ring, which goes to that wire so I don't get them reversed. What else? Oh, I've also measured the distance from the end of the shaft here to the surface of the slip ring block so I know how far I have to press the block back on the shaft once I'm done with the repair. That way the brushes will line back up. Okay. Let's see. Got a little washer here on the nose of the shaft. I don't imagine this is going to be on here too tight. It's only, I don't even know, maybe a piece of nylon. I'm not sure what that's made out of. Let's see if we can pull that off the shaft. Yep, there it goes. Should be using a ratchet or a wrench for this, not an not an adjustable. Yeah, not too much force required to pull it off of there. Like I said it is only a piece of plastic. That feels like it might wiggle its way off by hand now. or not. Okay. Okay, so, well, let me take you off the stand here. hold this in my hand and we'll take a look at it. Focus on that please. There you go. So that's it. Those are the studs. Wow, what is that? Is that a piece of uh, wire right there on that one? Come on. What is that? That looks like a piece of winding wire. Yep. So that's literally all they did. So they laid the wire through that little notch. Focus please. Through that little notch and they just stabbed these pins in it. They just put the pins in and stabbed it right in right into those uh, little round holes. I'm sure those holes were pre 
drilled and there was a notch cut across so they laid the wire in there and they just pressed those pins right in how how uh how insecure and they just hoped that they would make a good connection that one's bent i don't know if i bent that one on the way out pulling it out or if it was bent like that from the factory uh, but we can certainly uh, engineer something better than that can't we very interesting I wonder if I should leave those pins there maybe they prevent they also prevent the slip ring block from rotating on the shaft maybe but that was a that was a pretty firm fit I don't see the the block itself rotating on that shaft once I press it on so I think I think I I'd be good to cut those pins off and not not rely on the the press the, the pins being pressed in there to keep it from rotating. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, let me get this out onto the bench and do some thinking about it. See if I can come up with a better solution than that. Okay, so here's my simple repair that I came up with. So the two pins that were pressed into the slip ring block are knurled. See that? And they intercept the slip ring. Well, let's see. Let's let me. Uh, let's see. This one here is the long one. Goes all the way through and intercepts the slip ring over here. And then the short one obviously goes to this slip ring. So push them out. I straightened them because they were bent, both of them, and soldered two pieces or a piece of 14 gauge wire to each of them. Seemed to solder pretty well. Now I'm going to press these back in and we're going to press the slip, slip ring block back on the rotor shaft. I'll still have the pins here, the ends of these pins to align it or to keep it from rotating and then hopefully we can solder the end of the enameled wire to the little section of 14 gauge. That should give me a good strong electrical and mechanical connection. Alright, let's keep going. That looks pretty good. Slip ring block is now installed back on the rotor shaft. I did have to remove some of the plastic where the original pins, well, where the pins were inserted to clear my, uh, my new solder joint here. Same thing with the other side. Well, I'll show you this here. So we haven't soldered it yet. Turn the light on. But that is the connection I need, I need to solder right there from my 14 gauge extension wire to the actual rotors winding wire. So this is the side that had not failed. This is the failed side. Pretty much a similar setup. Had to remove some of the plastic. And uh, there, there we go. There's a little wire coming out from underneath that coil. Got it wrapped around. Got one wrap around the 14 gauge and I got the 14 gauge curled around that. So we're going to go ahead and solder that up, and I'll show you when I'm done. Soldering is complete. This one looks like it came out nice. And this one looks good as well. So we got the meter here. 
Let's see what we got for rotor resistance now. There we go, 26.5. I believe that's bang on. So, that's good. Because we're going to have to cut the video short this week anyway, because the temperature and pressure valve on my hot water heater just failed. So, looks like the, uh, the seal blew out there. So, I know what I'm doing this afternoon. So, thanks for watching, and uh, hopefully we'll pick this up next week. Get this thing put back together, and get it running on the load bank.